So sometimes someone will ask, what is this analog computing thing? Because when I think of analog computing, I think of like boards and things that you would solder together. And then people talk about programmable analog. What is this? I never thought you'd ask. And in fact, let's, we can actually talk about this more. Well, when people say programmable analog, does that mean like some new memristor thing? Um, no, this is going to take a while. <clears throat> so let's go through a few things. Well, I have 30 to 40 minutes. Great, that'll work. So first we want to kind of start by thinking how most people are looking at the world. They usually sort of think about, oh yeah, there may be some of these nano things and all the world is all deep neural networks. But to kind of get a sense of where we came from, you kind of got to go back a little bit, a little further. Yep. Um, okay, maybe not quite that far, but it's useful to know that you had things like Turing machines back there, like almost 100 years ago. So where you actually have a computer and a tape, and you have to understand when they were talking about it then, the computer was a room of people all working along, and the tape was actually meant to be a whole row of books. This was all basically based off of English bookkeepers, which is how all of digital computing works. That being said, let's zoom out a little bit, because I want to talk about the fact that many years ago, we still had a lot of people thinking about some of these questions in analog computing. So let's kind of go back to like the, the late 80s. You had like digital VLSI was a big thing. Hot field networks were around and all of the unsupervised learning and maps were already starting to be discussed. There were discussions what you might have of analog computing, what could be happening, who knows. And a lot of times those happened, you know, in the evening over beverages. So what you found is like people would say, well, you know, brains are doing using computations. Well, yeah, it's a good example of analog computing. And yet Moore's Law makes digital better every year and year, and this is going to happen. Good beer. Hopfield said something, you know, this network's to solve the traveling salesman problem. You know, and I think there's something in the analog dynamics to that. Wouldn't that be really cool? But what do you do about the local minimas? Uh, maybe you can get a good enough solution. Maybe you can do some expanding constraints to get solve, you know, things like what you saw, the new linear al programming algorithms. Really neat stuff. And all sorts of things about what computing could look like. And then people would leave the establishment. And it was good. and But unfortunately, no one ever believed it would ever be possible. I mean, who would ever think of actually having a commercial analog computer? That just seems strange, right? Um, wait, maybe? So that's where things were, and it never really left the establishment. And so that's kind of where things started. You know, you start looking back 30 years ago. Well, kind of zoom back out. Things kind of changed since then. You had this whole concept of single transistor learning synapses where you had floating gate devices. That changed a whole set into looking at analog computation where you had computing and memory um, nearly two decades ago. You had discussions in acoustics and speech and computer vision and all from these very first crossbar devices. No further, you actually had experimental verification, so your, your 1000x improvement over digital. And that turned out to be amazing. And eventually started getting FPA devices and they kind of started kind of small. You know, they, they started, you know, it was really cute. And they, but you know, you kept working with the floating gates and other kinds of non vol you know, all those non volatile structures and they grew up. And eventually you get to the system level discussions you see today. It's pretty impressive what, what's possible. And the short summary of it is you have FPAs that can be all sorts of analog and logic and routing and that now actually can do, you know, signal processing as well as having tools, as well as doing sort of full end to end computation all the way through in very, very small structures. So you might think, okay, the technology is possible, but what is this analog computation thing? This seems kind of strange and unique. Well, let's kind of talk about this. Because when you talk about digital computing, you actually start from these Turing machine representations and go work all the way down. So when you pull up your laptop, you have all these things like algorithms and numerics and, and levels of representation and all of that is possible. That works great. When you do analog computation, you go, hmm, what model do I start with classically? Don't know. Lots of confusion. You go find an expert. A miracle occurs. And then eventually you start something gets built and you wonder, hmm, this doesn't seem like something that's fairly scalable, but it's possible. 
So a couple key things are important. One is talking about abstraction. And digital is usually thought of as being the things that can be built with a few components, but analog just can't be done that way. You talk about the numerical aspect, where you talk about pristine digital computation versus analog that's really noisy and messy, and you really don't want to work with it if you didn't have to. And then you talk about analog architecture and complexity, which generally is thought of there's just not that much there, but if there was anything, you just do things like you do digitally for all the analog stuff, and you're good to go. The question is, are these perspectives right? And in fact, with recent work, we're starting to see that there's actually some different views here. So let's kind of go on that journey a little bit. And that journey has been fueled by knowing FPA devices. So you start talking about the tools, and the tool set kind of starts this that we've built from FPA devices, where you have a typical block where you just have a couple of blocks and you take it. And from that, you can not only get experimental measurements out, um, but you can also get, you know, you can also simulate all of this. And you think, okay, that's pretty cool. This is what we mean by the representation of analog design, which kind of surprises people. And you go, that's great. These are cute little blocks. I wonder what's in the blocks. And then you start looking at it, and you're like, oh my gosh, there's a lot there. Well, let's look a little closer. What you also see is you go, well, let me look at some just basic sort of fundamental analog blocks. You know, this being a C4 block, which is a uh, typical bandpass filter block. And you think, oh, no problem, and you just compile it up. Well, when you look at it, it's actually this interesting two floating gate OTAs. You're like, no problem, a floating gate OTA. And then you think, well, what's in what's in that OTA structure with all the capacitors and all that programming? Well, that's a whole other set of material. Oh, yeah, there's a capacitor there, too. And that's actually a whole switch. There's a whole bunch of switches that allow me to choose one to run this in continuous time. Many, many levels of representation that are just naturally compiled into the structure. Okay, well, I'm sure when we look at the test bench that we won't see much more there. Because here's your typical test bench. There's that simple bandpass filter block. This would be in the example code in the, in the structure. And you think, easy enough. Well, there's a DC bias element, which is takes another floating gate OTA, which we've already seen what that looks like. The arbitrary waveform generator actually uses the microprocessor, a whole bunch of on-chip DACs, and a bunch of routing. And all of this gets routed together. Uh, from a vector that you might have had in your high-level tools. And the ramp ADC, oh, well, now that actually is a whole other set of compiled circuits with another OTA, a bunch of end of switch fabric elements, routing elements, and, oh yeah, interrupts driven into the processor. There's a lot of levels of abstraction. This is mixed signal, but it's actually driven heavily by the fact that the analog can be abstracted. And this is going to be essential to any practical FPA design. And so, and this is something that just happens naturally at this point. And oh, by the way, try doing a system level classifier like you saw previously, and you're like, oh, this can get quite exciting and quite interesting. So you think, okay, well, if I gather all the blocks together and we start doing this over many applications, you start to find that there's levels of this between computing, sort of the system blocks, biasing blocks. Um, and this is just one early example that you can imagine. There's a lot more complex stuff that is starting to really be understood and being able to be regressed down. And you get sort of this fundamental structure that tells you what are the computation and the key blocks you might want to work with. Well, that then gets us to this whole next question of digital analog numerical analysis and talks about, you know, what is our problem difficulty? And so there's a nice way to think about this. And you might think about it as how would I look at the various topics in, that I would present in a course, and usually you're going to go from easy to hard. And you look at this in log complexity. Well, if I'm looking at this in, um, if I look at this for something like digital structures, usually the first major topic is going to be solving AX equal B. There can be LU decomposition and so forth. If I was doing this in an analog space, I'd probably start off with talking about differential equations. And this should kind of tell you some things right away, as well as the fact that things get worse and worse for digital as I go to ODs and PDs. For analog, things get harder and harder as I move towards solving linear equations, doing differentiation, pure differentiation, not ODs, and more towards LUD composition. What's interesting is that you can start to talk about doing iterative solutions of linear equations by actually creating a differential equation. And there's good demonstration that it actually works very effectively. Um, and quite competitively, as well as the, the at an energy efficiency and complexity level, that's quite a bit less. This is really interesting 
because what you find for digital is it's always about having good starting precision. Analog is about having good intermediate numerics, and that leads you to moving towards linear equation solution versus ODE solutions. We're going to talk about this a little bit further. Now, of course, if the analog solves all your decomposition, which is still an open question at the time of recording this, um, but if that is, that gives us even one more interesting data point of how this will all fit together. So we talked about the question of starting precision, and this is a question of between analog and digital, that analog tends to be, it requires a cost of a 2x improvement for every increasing bit, where digital, it has a logarithmic change, and that has a very profound implication, originally shown um, by people like Eric Vitos and Raul Sharpeskar, uh, really important kind of concepts here. On the other hand, if you have at least some programmability, it does help your overall crossover points, but this is still going to be true. So starting precision is always an issue. Whereas on the flip side for analog, the numerics is really good because every time I do summation, it is a law. It's Kirchhoff's current law, and that same thing is true on capacitors. Whereas for digital, every summation, I lose some accuracy every single time I add or add or subtract things. And that becomes pro pro unbelievably profound when I do differential equations. And I have to run things continuously. So that's where the starting precision versus numeric precision becomes essential. And when I look at differential equation solutions, you realize there's these classic plots uh, for, say, second order structure where as the step side decreases for a while, it gets better, but then at some point, it'll actually get worse again. Knowing full well that in analog, there just isn't any ODE issues to begin with. And that kind of sets the whole conversation. And so this is, again, where you go AX equals B makes sense because you have high precision numbers, short numeric accumulations. Um, but an AX equals B is your numerical benchmarks. And so this is how we think of computing in, in a digital sense. OK. So then you go, what do I do about architectures? <laughs> well, digitally, you talk about classically about having large processors. There's always has some memory, and then there's computing between it. So you really focus everything on the processors. That's what you worry about. And every almost most digital architectures, you talk about this with a few interesting caveats. Well, in analog, you have the classical Mead hypothesis, which basically says, look, the, the devices themselves that are doing analog, say for a multiplication, are a whole lot smaller, and the energy you require is a whole lot smaller. So you might actually make an argument of that, wait, maybe the processing computing now is almost nothing. Well, OK, so then that means that really your question is, how do I get data in and out of these things? And how do I deal with those little memory things that we just kind of ignored, right? So how do I deal with this? Well, I start rethinking this as a small processor, you know, kind of case, but the routing is dominant. And actually, I want to take this one step further and think about the routing and the memory and all that communication is the cost. So this is really a very different mindset. Um, it's kind of the best case situation if you ever had it digitally. And the communication does get better on the analog, but nowhere near the computing part of it. And this is one of the things you watch for. Um, and any physical computing system would run into this. And the worst thing you could do is having a large off, sort of a large memory, even worse having it an off chip memory for all of these structures. And so what you really want to be doing is doing computing in memory, as was sort of the original concept, you know, talked about two decades ago. Here's actually where it comes in, into a practical sense from an algorithm side. We often want to have a lot of algorithms that are done as trees. And, you know, versus sort of talking about something as a common bus, uh, where you have n processors, or maybe in a mesh architecture, you have a very similar thing. Because the tree architecture you think about is having a log n kind of order, you know, versus the, the order n for the, for the lower structure. Well, guess what? Uh, for trees, if I'm starting to actually look at communication costs, there is no log n anymore. It's always order n. And this has implications both in this case, but it has implications in things like analog to digital converters, where the communication cost for connecting to a bunch of comparators may be equal or worse than the comparator itself. So what you begin to see is that very different mindset. Analog architecture, the computing is basically free. The communication and memories are expensive. So you really want computing and memory. It just becomes essential there. You begin to realize in the numerical analysis is this high starting precision versus good numerics. And then in the analog abstraction, you're talking about things that are just sort of essential to modern analog computing. It can be done, and you really see the fundamental components. 
And this is really cool because once you have this framework, you can go, wait, this leads me down to another path. And now, now we start to go through a forest, this sort of forest of all knowledge. And we get to this question of what do I mean by physical computing? And all of a sudden now we sort of fell into this interesting sort of computing pay space, but it's kind of driven by these things we're talking about. What is this Turing machine thing and how do we begin to talk about it over reels? Well, let's come back to the conversation we had before over the fact that analog computing is basically hoping for a miracle to occur and a smart person to figure it all out. Well, if you start to put these pieces in place, you begin to build an infrastructure that looks very similar to what you saw for this physical computing, for the digital computing stuff now in physical computing. And you can begin to think, well, what is this sort of higher level dual to a digital Turing machine? And that looks like an analog Turing machine. Pretty incredible what's possible here. So you go, well, wait, what is this real valued computation again? And uh, well, that's just physical computing. It's computing over real values, you know, like analog and neuromorphic and optical and quantum computing. All of these are computing over real values. And why does it matter? And is the world really real? Uh, I'm don't quite sure about that. Well, it turns out that particles, you know, are going. You might think about it, are discrete things, but they really have continuous wave functions. They're continuous in space and time. So if you kind of look at this, it's actually a very sort of continuous um, structure all the way through. And so even when it's a particle, you're real valued in space and time. Well, people will go, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. If it's a real value, there's still noise, right? So the noise is going to make this really an integer, right? And the reason, the concept is, no, that's not actually correct. It turns out it may have real space with noise still means that the structure is real, but with some not ideal part of it. We want to interpret this maybe as running it through an ADC with discrete levels, but that's actually fundamentally transforming what's going on and fundamentally changing the computing. And so one would actually want to talk about, I'm dealing with computing in real space with noise, and then look at its results. Maybe it eventually becomes a discrete alphabet, but it becomes that, which is you know similar even in digital, right? We talk about computing over that medium. There's noise in there. We understand that's just there. So that's part of how that works. So noise in our values does not mean I'm I'm an integer. And what's also important is if I have something over multiple real value dimensions. I can always formulate that into a single real value dimension. Same thing could be due in terms of infinite, um, uh, infinite integer dimensions. The same conversation shows up in both cases. Uh, and so the complexity doesn't change having two dimensions or four, although you'd really like to have at least two to kind of keep these safe. So what you find is you have this, and there's kind of this sense of, well, between analog and optical and quantum and neuromorphic, there should sort of be kind of a, a similarity of operating over these real and continuous variables. And this is really neat because if that is true, there's a transformation possible. Um, but there's kind of interesting power that's possible in any one of these fields. And there's other real value fields that could be really neat in this. But the issue then gets into going into digital side because now I need to transfer between real and continuous. Well, if I have an integer thing and I move it to the real side, no problem. But if I have something that is real and I need to move it to the integer side, I have to be making approximations. And this is fundamentally what we have a problem with when I do numerical analysis of differential equations and partial differential equations. I can get good solutions, but it's only true for some cases. It's going to have, always have some approximation, and it's always going to not be good enough. And part of that is just the fact of, if I'm looking at real values, there's so many more than there are integers. And in fact, there's an infinite number of real values between each pair of successive integer values. This turns out to be a huge capability and possibility as we look at the structures. So remember one more thing. Differential equations are real value computation and therefore has part of these issues. So you can start to say, well, physical computing is now really start to look like the second order PDEs that govern a lot of these different types of physics. And if you can kind of be able to look at the different PDEs, you can kind of make equivalencies. So quantum has your sort of your favorite sort of wave guiding equation that is Schrodinger's equation. You have optical computing, which is sort of second order um, space and time. But the, again, there's a sort of similarity to this, depending how you set up the problems. You'll see things in neuromorphic computing. 
which you know actually has these sort of second order space, first order time equations. You can actually make these be have a similar physics to the quantum side or to the optical side in terms of the wave guiding properties. Uh, when you talk about neuromorphic computing, there's a whole space that one can get into uh, in terms of devices and what's possible and what the computation is, but we're not going to go there today. And then you can also get into analog computing. Again, you can create all of these PDE structures. And what's amazing is that you can definitely look at having at least two real values um, parts of the computation, any of these spaces, and then be able to work through any of these and have enough similarities between all the sort of these governing PDs that you can make equivalence between each of them. And so this really is cool that there is that sort of similarities between each of these spaces. And so that allows me to start talking about building these models of analog and you know physical computation where I'm looking at a real valued sort of Turing machine versus an integer valued Turing machine. And these have huge opportunities. Now the digital one, there's a huge amount of theory. It's well modeled. We understand it's like the basis of everything. And in fact, knowing that there's a connection between these brings a lot of power there. But the models of the analog computing aspects say, look, there's some opportunities we hadn't thought about, or maybe had only hoped for, maybe over beverages in the evening. Like all of the MP problems in the sort of integer space, maybe they can be solved in polynomial time, in in the sort of analog slash physical computing space. There's a whole set of what is the space of computability? And there's a whole opportunity there. And that computability space is important because we see amazing things in quantum computing, which probably translates into some very interesting spaces here on, on the physical space that are very difficult things to do on the digital side. So when we look at the discussions on analog computing, what we're hoping for in the end is that these are not just discussed over beverages in the evening, although that is a wonderful thing, and I would always encourage we continue to do that over your favorite beverages. Uh, mine these days tend to be hot chocolate. And, you know, as part of serious technical discussions, you know, at whatever conferences you find that are actually the important ones and to be able to be able to work with both of these cases. And of course, this really becomes part of our discussion because we have these FPA devices and also important because we have these floating gate devices that allow us the programmability.